Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Women Who Rock Investigates, where branding just got even better. Our media source provides case studies in the areas of breaking news reports, health policy and government, human resources, and more. Our handpicked experts provide our audiences with credible information to validate the latest in these studies. Women Who Rock Investigates are heard over most of your radio podcasts, such as Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, and iHeartRadio, just to name a few. We are interested in getting our experts heard around the globe, and we have partnered with Live 365 and Airtime Pro Radio to extend their voices of claims and theories. Join us each Thursday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time after Women Who Rock with Success. Now, let's go to the show. And good morning and welcome to Women Who Rock Investigates. This is your show host, Ms. Diane Winbush, and we thank you for tuning in with us on today. And today we have a different kind of topic um, in regards to the case studies that we actually um, hear on the studio. And so today we're going to be talking about laws of parties. And so um, I know a lot of times this subject is kind of, um, I guess, uh, people do not challenge it, uh, does not challenge the law. Uh, from some research that I have looked on for the last a couple of weeks, there are, I think the last time I saw someone lobbying for it was like uh, 2009. So um, there were some audiences. They are concerned about uh, this bill, and so we have some experts that are going to be on the podcast with us today to be able to help us to be able to understand a little bit more about the law of parties because Texas is the main central uh, uh, star location as to where this bill, I think, actually started. So let's welcome our guests uh, to the show, and uh, they are none other than a criminal defense attorney, uh, Luke Woods, and then we also have uh, Michael Goldstein that is on the broadcast One of our attorneys um, Lilas was supposed to be on today But she had a last minute court um, Hearing So um, good morning gentlemen And welcome to the show Good morning Diane Okay. okay good great. morning Diane so it's, Thank you You're welcome So first what we're going to do Is we always allow the audience To be able to learn just a little bit more About your practice And as to what you do So that will give them a little bit more credibility of what you do in your field. So we're going to start with Michael and um, tell us a little bit about you and your practice. Sure, thank you. Um, and hello to all your listeners. I, I, I wish I could meet you. I appreciate your appreciation of uh, what's important in fairness in the, what we call the criminal justice system. Um, I been practicing criminal law off and on for about 29 years, strictly doing criminal appeals. Um, I'm a, I do that in California. I'm a member of the bar there as well as the local federal courts, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, graduated from Stanford Law School for what that's worth. Um, and and, um, and I got into it through sort of a circuitous route, but at the heart of it is my passion for justice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Luke, you can go ahead. Hi. I, uh, uh, greetings to your listeners. I do appreciate uh, anybody taking the time to learn about uh, uh, issues that you bring up during the course of your podcast, particularly this one. And I do agree that there seems to be uh, not a lot of focus on this. Um, and uh, my experience, I've, I haven't been a lawyer as long as, uh, as the other participant here, probably about half of the time. Uh, I do not uh, uh, specialize in appeals, but I do specialize in criminal defense. Uh, about 15 years now, I have uh, worked my way up through the trenches, uh, started out in district court doing um, non-jury trials on trespassing and uh, CDS and uh, pretty much um, the variety misdemeanor offenses and worked my way up to um, to jury trials of uh, serious felonies, um, the possession of intents, uh, murders, manslaughters, sex offenses, um, all the way up. Uh, I, I actually, I think I'm one of the few people in the state that um, uh, litigated a bigamy case. Uh, mm -hmm. The um, uh, moved into private practice and I've been doing the same work uh, for the past year. Uh, and I um, uh, 
look forward to this topic. Um, and, uh, I'm interested to hear uh, an appellate uh, view of it as well. Mm-hmm. Great, and thank you both for being our guests on the day because this is a topic that some uh, some individuals uh, and lawmakers too perhaps may have kind of pushed under the rug because there was a not a enough uh, voice that is going out in regards to um, the subject. And so there were a lot of um, uh, families that um, have individuals that are incarcerated that are concerned about this. There are uh, offenders that have reached out to our um, our uh, platform to see if we could they could be able to get some answers in regards to this and of course those that are already listening um, that are re- our regular listeners of course they always enjoy whatever topic we bring to them so we're going to start with Michael uh, Michael could you share with the audience a little bit about the definition of law of parties yeah um, to be honest when you reached out about this I had to look it up because in my state we don't call it that. Um, Texas does, as you pointed out, and uh, I'm not sure any other jurisdictions do. People may also know it as um, aiding and abetting law or the law of being an accessory to a crime or an accomplice. Um, In its most straightforward form and I think justifiable, uh, at least in theory, it means that if I try to get you to commit a crime or assist you in committing a crime, then I'm guilty of it as well. So if you and I go into a grocery store um, to rob it and you're carrying a gun and uh, I'm not and we walk up to the cashier and you demand the money and receive it and I say nothing, do nothing, we go back to the car, divide up the money, I'm guilty of armed robbery too, um, which, you know, I think most listeners would agree makes sense. Where it gets hairy, and and um, supposedly, and, and so under federal law, if it's a matter of assisting in the commission of a crime, um, at least in theory, you have to do so with the intention of assisting in commission of that crime. Um, Many states, including mine, go beyond that, saying, well, you don't have to intend to assist it. It's enough if the other person's crime was a foreseeable result of something you did. So if we're driving up to the grocery store um, and you legally possess a gun and I say, you know, I need to stop and get some cigarettes, but I don't feel safe in this neighborhood. Can I carry your gun? Uh, And I walk into the store and hold it up. Uh, If a a jury is going to be told that if it was foreseeable that I might hold up the store, maybe because it's something you knew about my character, um, then you're guilty of armed robbery, (laughs) even though you didn't intend to facilitate my commission of the robbery. And um, even in jurisdictions, and I'll I'll be quiet in a minute and give Luke a chance to speak to this, but I want to add that even in jurisdictions that have this stricter and, in my view, more justifiable rule, like the federal one, um, there are... um, a lot, for example, I, my understanding is there are a lot of women in federal prison for possession of a, a controlled drug for sale because, simply because they allowed their boyfriend who made the life choice to make a living by selling drugs to keep his stash in their apartment because he was subject to search conditions or whatever. Um, and you know, theoretically, if they went to trial, the government would have to prove that she wasn't just indifferent to what he was doing, but, um, you know, really wanted to help him sell drugs. Uh, and, um, but as a trial attorney like Luke will probably confirm, um, the vast majority of cases don't go to trial. People have to plead out to something. So there are a lot of women in prison um, for aiding and abetting or what yeah, some call the law of parties, you know, for just going along with something. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And so, um, and the reason why I think the the, the topic is so, um, I guess, sensitive is because uh, there have been some, and we're going to uh, let you speak in just a minute, Luke, but I wanted to uh, reiterate that there are uh, some offenders that have been already executed. And so I think the issue is, especially with the state of Texas, is where they have um, – Two people commit a crime, and then one uh, gets the death penalty, but the other one did not do anything, but they was the getaway. And so we're talking about the case with Kenneth Foster. And so, of course, he's all over YouTube. He's, uh, I think uh, they did a documentary on him uh, uh, on Netflix. Uh, there are a lot of uh, journalists that have reached out to him um, in the state of Texas. He was able to get his conviction uh, overturned. Um, to a life sentence uh, um, issue. So, um, and I think that's what people are concerned about as to why, if they was just a getaway person or they maybe was driving the car, of course they can be able to be charged the same way, but they they still get the same conviction. You get the death penalty even though, uh, you know, I did not do anything, I, even though I was there. You know, that's common sense. If you're there, you're going to get something for being there, whether you're just the lookout man or the lookout woman or what have you. But I think what the, what the outcry is uh, going on now is in regards to everyone receiving the same penalty. So uh, go ahead, Luke, and thank you so much for that, Michael. Go ahead, Luke, and respond to that. And, and just oh, I, let I me just say, after Luke speaks, I have a California story that's as bad as that, too. Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, okay, go ahead, uh, Luke, and then we'll, let, we'll come back to you, Michael. Well, I, I think he, uh, Michael did an excellent, uh, excellent job of describing accomplice liability Absolutely. and uh, the application to the to, to the statute. And, and I think it's really important to understand that distinction of uh, bl- uh, layers of culpability during the course of an offense. I mean, you start mm-hmm. out with being merely present. If you just sit there and watch something happen, some states say a non-objecting witness to a crime who didn't notify the police, that's not enough to convict somebody. But then you move to the concept of uh, accomplice liability, which was described by Michael. And you can also think about it, two people entering a store, um, they are planning to uh, steal a candy bar. Uh, so one acts as the lookout, looking back and forth, to see if anybody's coming to warn them if somebody comes. And then one reaches down, grabs the uh, candy bar, and, uh, and uh, walks out of the store with it. Uh, the person who grabbed that candy bar, that would be the principal, and the person helping out, the lookout, would be uh, an accomplice. And similar to this uh, are participation-type offenses like conspiracy, agreeing to come together to commit a crime like a bank heist or something like that, and taking a substantial step towards that crime. Uh, accessory, it's similar to accomplice liability. It can be before or after the fact, and you can throw attempt in there as well. But each variation evidence is a lower amount of culpability than the principal offender, the guy that actually reached down and grabbed the stole and stole that candy bar. And most states have limitations on the punishments that can be received as a result of the conviction. So, and it's, for instance, in Maryland where I practice, while a sentence can, get, can be the same for a conspiracy to commit a felony, it's considered a misdemeanor, as is attempt in most cases. And sentencing guidelines are built to take into account the level of involvement in the offense. Did a person take the primary role in the offense, i.e. take the candy bar, or not? Did they just act as a lookout? So now we go back to the Law of Parties Act, and this is astonishingly broad and impacts a gr- large amount of people. Uh, it, it abolishes the distinction between accomplices and principals and punishes all participants equally for not only the intended concerted crime, which, as Michael said, is understandable. If somebody's acting for, as a lookout for stealing a candy bar, um, you understand that their involvement in that offense, they should be fun- punished for it. But any crimes committed in the process, whether intended or not, by the person involved in the scheme. The, the, it's basically the logic is in for a penny, in for a pound. So take that candy bar bandit. Say he's caught in the act of stealing and both the lookout and the thief try to run away. Mm-hmm. The thief is grabbed by the loss prevention officer and decides to, decides to pull out a gun and shoot the officer to effectuate the escape, killing him in the mm-hmm. process. Under the law of parties, it doesn't matter that the lookout didn't intend to kill that loss prevention officer. He can still be found criminally responsible for the conduct of the the candy bar bandit, 
and convicted of murder and received the death sentence in Texas. There is a, a language in the death that the death should have been anticipated, but in practice, you know, if a gun's involved, the uh, jury's going to find that uh, a death should have been uh, anticipated. Uh, mm-hmm. It is astonishingly broad. Um, and the concept behind this, the statute says, um, if another crime is committed, you're on the hook for it. While Texas is the broadest, there are other, many other states have a similar concept uh, called the felony murder doctrine. Uh, that indicates that uh, during the course of a felony, such as a bank robbery, that if you are involved in that bank robbery and somebody dies in the process, the lookout dri- driver can be held liable for uh, murder, even though that was not intended. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so thank you so much for that, Luke. And so before you before put a pin in that right quick, uh, Michael, and so and, 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 and those are really good. To, and, and, and I'm not for sure. I did not read the whole entire story of the of the uh, Kenneth Foster uh, Jr. Um, 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 case and what have you. But I did see that there were I think it was a. Um, attorney's son or relative or something like that that was um, involved that was the one that was actually harmed fatally wounded so somehow I guess um, the defendant felt that that was a more like a bias thing it was more like a prejudice and he felt that um, that was the reason why he uh, obtained that ruling but you know the law is the law and so um, I just wanted to kind of bring that out, and uh, and perhaps there were some things that uh, perhaps he was not aware of at the time of the offense. So we're going to go back to Michael, and we want you to be able to share uh, uh, your your uh, piece, which you uh, wanted to share with us about the California story. Sure, and um, thank you. And I'm, I'm really glad Luke added the pieces about conspiracy law and the felony, felony murder rule. And, uh, you know, those are each worth a long discussion, but um, they're definitely related to the law of parties and in exactly the ways Luke said, um, they can implicate people for for punishment for things that they just didn't intend to be a part of. Um, mm-hmm. I had a client, and, and the only thing that Luke said that I take issue with is uh, Texas being the worst. Uh, in, mm. in California, which is supposedly a liberal progressive state with bleeding heart liberal criminal freeing justices on its courts, um, the, the the restrictions such as they are just as loose. Um, I had a client named Orlando Romero mm-hmm. um, who, when he was 20 and um, doing crazy self-medication things because of all the abuse he'd suffered, was going out with a group of other young men and robbing people at gunpoint. Um, and one day out in the desert, they saw a guy doing um, practicing tricks on his motorcycle, on his dirt bike. And these three guys in the car decided to stop and rob him because this was a desolate area. He was all alone. Um, and Orlando said, wait a minute, what he's doing is so cool. I want to go down and talk to him um, and just, you know see what he's into, where he learned to do this, what kind of guy he is. So um, Orlando goes down and chats with uh, Jose Aragon for a while about his biking. And his brother, um, who was even wilder and doing more awful things at this time, wanted to try out a new rifle that he had stolen in another robbery that had a telescopic sight on it. Um, and he shot and killed Jose Aragon, the victim, while Orlando was chatting with him. And mm. um, Orlando was found guilty of first-degree capital murder and given a death sentence for that. And the California Supreme Court, I think I have it in front of me, wrote, because um, the non-target offense, meaning the target offense would have been robbery, because the non-target offense is unintended, the mental state of the aider and or better, that was my client, with respect mm-hmm. to that murder, with respect to the murder, is irrelevant. And culpability is imposed simply because a reasonable person could have foreseen the commission of murder. Um, mm-hmm. And um, 
You know, Orlando was executed by COVID in California. He died August 2nd from the disease. Um, mm. But, uh, you, you know, there, I don't think there's anything Texas does that California won't allow either. And it's, you know, another huge jurisdiction that um, puts a lot of people on death row, executes them more slowly. But, yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I wanted to add. Okay. Okay, great. Because we – because – on, on, on several media uh, uh, channels or broadcasting channels, you'll you see now that people are coming out of the woodwork as to how they respond to verdicts um, in the courtroom, and sometimes individuals are not versed in the law as to know what it means and and what have you. And so you have people they will, you know, they'll try to bring, blame it on the attorneys. And so that's the reason why we we created um, this case study podcast to be able to help individuals a little bit more to understand the law in different states. You know, from state to state, laws are different. And so we try to help them to have a little bit more at ease so this will not be able to create a pandemic in the courtroom as to um, the individuals, the, the, the offenders, their defendants, their family members not um, having all of the knowledge so they will not be, you know, just going berserk and radical. And this is not the only thing that we talk about on the, on the podcast. Of course, we do health and other uh, topics as well, but this one is kind of crucial just a little bit. So I'm going to read a little statement to you um, uh, that I shared with both of you uh, to an email, and it says, according to ABC News, and, this, and, and after I uh, get through reading this, then Luke, you can respond to this. So it says, according to ABC News, case, KSAT 12 news station in 2013, class student, this is a student now, Logan Davidson was attacked by some students, which led to his death. So, of course, you know that probably is bullying. So it so so it states that although the accused Enriquez um, Gonzalez was charged, but never threw a punch at the victim. However, Gonzalez was charged under the Law of Parties Act. And so uh, that was another question too. And even though I know that you all have shared a whole lot of content uh, on the podcast as well, but. He was an onlooker. You know how sometimes when when we were younger, we we you know when some, we'd be in the be in the hallway and all of a sudden someone said fight and then we just turn around and some people go to the fight and those that are intelligent stay away from the fight. But what Gonzalez did, he was just an onlooker. He he didn't have anything to do with it. He did not. He was not friends with these people that jumped this uh, teenager at this um, high school, which was in 2013. But somehow, just for him being there on the scene at the school, an onlooker, he still got charged as well. So I want you to respond to that, Luke, if you could. Sure thing. Uh, I just want to uh, circle back for just a minute about um, what Michael had mentioned about. I, I think I inartfully said that Texas was the worst in terms of application for felony murder. What mm-hmm. I meant, and, and this, is, this is the astonishing thing about Texas, and this feeds into to your question, is that the law of parties in Texas does not just apply to murder. It applies to any felony. So in most states, it's a felony murder do- doctrine. You do a felony and a murder comes uh, is a result of it. You're liable for that murder, even if it's unintended. In Texas, it's felony, felony. If you commit a felony and another felony happens during the course of it, you're on the hook for that. So in terms of the breadth of it, I don't think I've ever seen anything as broad. Uh, but I think I in our artfully say said that Texas was the worst on it. Um, as to your, your question, I, I went through the reports that the links that you had sent on the YouTube for the Logan Davidson case. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems that um, uh, Enrique, uh, the, act, the there's, there's two separations between Enrique, who did not throw a punch, and the unnamed juvenile who did and actually uh, gave the death blow. Uh, mm-hmm. Gonzalez was accused not of just being an onlooker, but of kind of setting up the fight and encouraging the unnamed person to punch um, oh. that still uh, it, 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 it's, it, it should not uh, rise to the level of, of uh, uh, culpability for him to be charged with murder, but, but it eventually under the law of parties, it, it did. Um, so I think that the, the involvement of Mr. Uh, Gonzalez was a little bit more than him just standing there. He did not, uh, he was not involved. He did not throw a punch, but in terms of his encouragement, I think that that's how they wrapped him in that he in some way, set up that fight or uh, encouraged the unnamed juvenile to, uh, to strike uh, the uh, Logan Davidson. The second part is uh, you'd asked about how the law could admit the actual assailant. Well, the actual assailant was, I mean, that would be a subject for another day. Um, okay. <laughs> but the short answer is the actual 
assailant was not admitted. He was charged and he was tried in the juvenile court system because he was under the age of 18. And it appears that Mr. Gonzalez actually testified against the unnamed assailant during the trial with an agreement that the state wouldn't use that testimony against him. And likely he had some agreement related to his own case. But for most states, and apparently including Texas, everybody has this arbitrary number, 18, that separates culpability outside of the law of parties between adults and children. Uh, mm -hmm. In Maryland, for instance, the child is charged as an adult for murder for any offense that you can get life imprisonment for. Is there, if you're 14 and up and you get charged with murder, you're charged as an adult. Uh, and for other violent offenses, such as uh, first degree assault and uh, um, uh, armed robbery, uh, if you're 16 and up, you're charged as an adult. And they have these procedures in place to transfer that, uh, that uh, defendant, that child, back into juvenile court systems in those situations um, to varying levels of, of success. But every state has, seems to have this uh, some level of treating children different than adults. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Gonzalez had hit that magic number of 18. And that's why we know his name and not the other party's name. And that's why he was charged under the, the law of parties. Um, that's my understanding, at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So like a protection for the, for the, um, for the I don't want to use the assailant, uh, uh, for the one that actually uh, uh, throat that final blow or through, through all of the blows, um, they were protecting his identity because of he was being a juvenile. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, Michael, did you want to respond to that? Just, um, I, I didn't see that link, and um, to my discredit, I, I'm not familiar with that case. Um, you know, I would say that as... You described, as you had understood it, you know, just being a bystander in theory, no one should be punished under the law of, you know, any states. Um, but given, as Luke described it, that he actually set it up, um, you know, then his treatment's a little more understandable. Although, again, you've got this situation where uh, a really unintended, horrible consequence. Uh, he's being held responsible for, which, you know, fits into the reason you're having us talk about this, the, the real injustice of these broad laws. Um, the only other thing I would say is, um, and I, again, I <laughs> express disagreement with someone as learned as my other panelists here, but uh, it's in California and in the other states I've looked at, it's, you know, it's not just with murders and this... Um, a very broad felony murder rule. In California, mm -hmm. the law of conspiracy is, as Luke described it, meaning um, that if you and I conspired to rob a bank and even agreed that no one was supposed to get hurt, but my co-conspirator and partner sh shot somebody um, and let's say they didn't die, so it's not the felony murder rule, but shot somebody and injured them, um, I'm going to be guilty of attempted murder and ag aggravated assault. Um, and, this, and, yeah, that's, that's enough about that. Um, okay, and I, okay. You know, I, I really appreciate the comments I'm hearing from both of you about, you know, how bad these laws are and how, how unjust they can be. Exactly, because even though they uh, the, the the law of parties acts uh, perhaps maybe uh, is is uh, you know in different other states, but I know Texas is taking the hardest punch for being more like an aggressive state uh, in regards to this law. And um, some of the um, offenders and their families and what have you, and some of the audience is from the from this particular state. And so they are um, they are looking or viewing at this state as being very harsh and cruel in regards to uh, this bill that uh, perhaps that was passed. So the next question I would like to ask, and this is going to be for the both of you all, and um, or we'll just say we'll just um, send this question to Luke um, in regards to the law of parties bill. So is it only applied to capital uh, uh, offenses? Because that's 
you know, once you look online, you do the research and what have you, that's what the, most of the content and data that you see that it's applied just to, you know, mostly capital um, um, uh, murder offenses or, or something that, uh, that can be able to send the person immediately to the death penalty. Well, I, I think um, Michael's comment just drives your point home that a lot of the uh, information related to the law of parties and the different applications between the states, you know, aren't in the news a lot. We don't hear about it a lot. I, mean, I had no idea that uh, California was as broad as, as Texas, and I, I feel that um, um, <laughs> it's disheartening. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so capital punishment isn't the only penalty that the law applies to, and apparently not in, in California or, nor in Texas. It doesn't appear to be. Um, it's uh, so you go uh, you go in with a group to commit, say, felony burglary in one of the per distance that that just as Michael just described, they commit a robbery, aggravated assault, any felony. Mm -hmm. uh, it's if you attempt to carry out a conspiracy to commit one felony and another one's committed, all conspirators are guilty, to, even though they didn't have an intent to commit it. Um, so, uh, no, uh, capital punishment isn't the only penalty, but it's the one that comes up the most in terms of learning about this subject because it just it it goes to our just the bottom of your 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 soul that there's something wrong that in terms of the harshest penalty that you can get the death sentence that mm -hmm. you've got a series of people on death row that had no intent to commit or kill a person and didn't take any actions towards actually killing that person mm -hmm. beyond, you know, some general involvement of another offense. So mm -hmm. when we think about it and hear about it in the news, it comes up in capital punish punishment cases more. Um, and that's probably the best way to, to, to uh, let your listeners learn about it is through cases such as that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because uh, you know, uh, you, you know, different uh, organizations. I guess I would say they lobby for different things, and so this is going to be leading to our next uh, segment in regards to um, people speaking out against this um, uh, bill. You know, sometimes individuals feel that the, even the the magistrates are um, supporting the bill as well. So, uh, take for instance, um, uh, a little bias. In the case, and that's what I was trying to mention earlier about uh, one of the individuals that that was on Texas death row, but he his conviction was overturned because he fought it himself, and so it was overturned to a life sentencing in 2007. So in regards to that, um, some individuals feel that some judges are very very critical and biased to um, the bill and as to how they apply it to. Um, individuals when they come in the courtroom and so that's the reason why it's kind of um sensitive for um, individuals and some individuals feel that the the bill is not fair so here is the next article and i'm sorry if you didn't get it uh, uh michael i thought i saw sent both of the links to both you link and lilas as well so i apologize for that so um, according to kvue news State representative. Now, this is way back in 2009, so this is the reason why we're bringing the subject back up now because it's very little that's being talked about this topic. So, uh, according to KVUE News, State Representative Harold Dutton from Houston, this deal's talking about the state of Texas, attempted to get this bill abolished in 2009. However, today we still hear a little bit about the bill. So is it, it do you feel, and this is not uh, something for you all to um, elaborate on as to you having expertise in this area, this is just our opinions um, in regards to this question. Do either one of you feel, and we're going to start with Michael first, do either one of you feel that the, the bill is not strong enough, the reason why it continues to um, always get um, I guess, cast down or overlooked and what have you, because this is an article that was back in 2009, and I, it's a very little that I have saw um, recently, recent reports on the, um, on the Law of Parties bill where people are actually lobbying, lobbying I'm sorry, and protesting um, trying to get this bill, uh, you know, uh, looked at as to why everyone is accused and received the same punishment. 
a lot of the a lot of the individuals they don't care about the about the punishment. They just don't want to receive the same punishment that the actual um, uh, uh, individual applied to the victim. So, Michael, we're going to start with you. This is just a commentary. This is our opinions. This you don't if you don't have any. Um, actual um, uh, credibility to it. We just still want to be able to share that as to why. This is a long time, 2009. That's the last that's the last research data that I found where someone was actually trying to get the bill abolished. So I'm actually going to claim a little expertise because I forgot to say when you asked us to tell a little bit about ourselves that um, while well, practicing law has been my day job. Uh, I've been deeply involved in activism since I was about 20 in, in 1967 um, and been doing all, in the last 10 or 15 years a lot of political writing on what it takes to get beyond the teeter-totter of the two-party system and actually have a, a just as well as peaceful and sustainable society. And I think what you're asking is a really important question, and it implicates broader ones. Um, as, as Luke and I were saying in answer to the previous question, um, you know, where the law of parties brings in the death penalty, you know, it especially impacts our sense of justice and fairness and, and uh, attracts the attention of the media. But as I mentioned in my example with the um, women who were doing federal time for um, possession for sale when they you know, weren't involved in the sales of drugs business in, in you know, any real or intentional way, um, it's part of the broader picture, in my view, of, of mass incarceration. Um, okay. And, you know, as you and your listeners know, uh, Politicians for a long time, I think starting in the 80s, um, get mileage out of being tough on crime and using, um, hopefully most of the time, indirectly racial stereotypes to bolster that, um, to pass tougher and tougher laws, stiffer and stiffer punishment. So while the law of parties and other you know, names for accomplice liability are ancient and go back to, you know, the common law of England, um, its impact has gotten worse and worse in this country as the criminal justice system is used, in my opinion, not only to prevent crime and deter it, but to keep populations that, uh, that some folks are afraid might rebel afraid enough of the state so that they won't. So, you know, there are two reasons why I'm not optimistic about reform and why I think you haven't heard anything about attempts to reform the Texas law since whatever it was, 2008-2009. One is mm -hmm. that in the cli climate that's been created, um, very few politicians want to look like they're sympathetic to criminals. So, mm -hmm. You know, um, I even had trouble using the word criminals because um, and it, I'd rather say people who've committed crimes or who are accused of committing crimes. Because, um, you know, uh, I'm a really honest person. I've probably, not probably, but I'm sure I've lied a few times in my life. I don't want to be known forever as a liar. And, and the people I know who've committed crimes, um, you know, are not just criminals. But, okay, that was... That was a tangent. The, the other reason that I'm not super optimistic about criminal justice reform and the law of parties or any other aspect of it in isolation is that I think there are systemic reasons why we have mass incarceration. And I alluded to them, and it's, you know, it's going to take really strong movements to give you know, even progressive politicians who would like to change some of the most egregious aspects of it, like the law of parties, the kind of political cover that they'd be willing or able to do it. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, Luke, would you like to respond on that one? 
Sure. I absolutely echo uh, Michael's view on why these laws uh, stay in the books so, so long. It's a, a, it's a win-win for a politician to, to, um, to run on, on uh, tough uh, statutes such as uh, uh, felony murder and law of parties. And uh, when one tries to overturn it, by, uh, like um, Representative Dutton did, um, they are uh, just no matter what their arguments are, they're uh, they're just targeted as uh, you're not tough on crime. Why would we want to go light on uh, light on uh, uh, criminals w- without even looking at the specific issues that come up, um, such as in Texas, where you've got one person on death row for being a participant, and the actual person who did the murder is on parole. Um, if, if you get, come up with results like that and, and, and show that to the, the public, uh, perhaps you get more um, traction. I'm a little bit more helpful than Michael, and it may just be because of the state that I uh, reside in, because we've had, we abolished the death penalty in, in 2013. And up until that point, uh, prior to abolishing it, it was so difficult to get. Um, 2009, they required DNA evidence and videotape confession for the penalty to apply. And uh, I, and so I, I see movements, you know, slowly, slowly chipping away at, at the felony murder doctrine. But in terms of the grand scheme of things, um, an ABA article in 2018, it indicated that there are 45 states have some form of felony murder on the books. And that is, you know, basically the aspect of uh, the law of parties that uh, makes the news all the time. Um, and of those 45 states, 24 of those 45 allow for the death penalty in those types of cases. So that it's not just Texas. There's 24 other states where a, a situation where a participant who didn't do the killing can be get the death penalty um, ba- based on the, the law of uh, the law of parties. Um, the, it'd be easier to state list the states that don't have felony murder, which are Hawaii, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio. Uh, I think Pennsylvania was looking to lower liability for participants in murder. And California, um, and Michael would know more about this than I, at least a year or so ago had reformed, had talked about reforming the felony, at least the felony murder rule to require major participation in a higher level of intent. And again, I defer to, 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 to Michael on that. Um, but I, I have hope. I have hope um, that uh, at least, and it may be from where I, I'm uh, sitting, um, uh, we've had justice uh, justice reform. Uh, the Justice Reform Act uh, got instituted a few years ago that uh, uh, it uh, cleared out uh, some of the overcrowding in the in the jails. It uh, mm-hmm. did away with cash bond. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, shifting a little to the mass incarceration that Michael was uh, uh, talking about, I. I have uh, some some guarded hope. Um, that's all, all that I would have on that subject. Absolutely, uh, you know, in regards to uh, to that, and thank you so much, uh, both of you, for that for your uh, comments. You know, um, here in the South, um, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, actually, um, I think uh, the the United States Attorney General um, was here about a couple of weeks ago. And he um, also um, gave them like a $3 million grant or something like that. And so um, and that was in regards to combating crime and what have you because the crime rate in that area is extremely high. Like uh, maybe I think they averaged like uh, 261 murders uh, per year. And so um, he came down and and it was all on the, it was, you know, over the news and what have you. And so, and, and I'm thinking that it's, it's, uh, later on it probably will change. It's probably just going to take a while to get there simply because of some of the laws that have been there for so long. It's just actually been there. And, 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 and thank you for bringing that out uh, to the both of you um, in regards to the law of parties. It's more just in Texas. I guess uh, perhaps maybe uh, this is the, 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 the biggest state that is just cracking down on it. They're just not going to 
give any leverage. They're just not, you know, they're not they're not going to be playing with uh, any felons or or any uh, defendants or what have you. When they say no, that's what they mean. And so I guess that's the reason why everybody is so tough against this uh, particular state because it was nothing really actually brought out about any of the other states, the 24, 25 states that actually have this um, this bill. But it was actually emphasized on Texas and then also online. Uh, when I did some research, Texas, when you uh, research uh, under Google, law of parties, that's the first state that comes up is Texas. So I don't know what they're doing there to make themselves uh, number one or or, or uh, they're at the top of the scale or radar or what have you in regards to this law, but they are certainly receiving a lot of attention in regards to it. And I did some research as to where I think already since this bill has been passed over the uh, the 50 states, there is 20 people that has been executed. So, and I guess that's the reason why the concern is kind of growing just a little bit, you know, in regards to that. So, uh, with just a few minutes left, um, what would you like to leave with the audience? And we're going to start with you, um, uh, uh, Michael, and then after that, uh, we'll be able to uh, cap the show off, and then you can be able to share with the listeners as to um, any upcoming uh, presentations or publications that you have published or how they can be able to follow you. Because on the show, what I do is we try to allow the um, the audience to be able to grasp a little bit more about you even after the studio, after the show is over, and then that way they can continue to be able to follow you, follow your product, your brand, whatever it is that you are um, 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 standing for in your state or in the U.S. So with Michael, what would you like to leave with the audience in regards to the topics that we have shared today? Wow, great question. Um, I guess number one, please do more of what you're doing right at this moment as far as paying attention to how the what we call the criminal justice system operates, you know, particularly in your state and your community. Um, and, yeah, I mean, despite my pessimism, um, I mean, mass incarceration, which, as I said, I think this is a part of, um, you know, not to mention the death penalty, which is certainly imposed a whole lot more, or, carried out a whole lot more in Texas than in California and most other states, um, uh, you know, causes just horrible pain to families uh, and disruption and creation of conditions that cause more crime. And I'd like your listeners to consider whether it really makes sense to try more and more and more of what doesn't work to control crime. And instead, and maybe, Diane, you can look into this on another show. Take a look at restorative justice, which does work, um, and then ask yourselves, well, why do we do the, use the retributive system that doesn't work? Um, okay. I could say more, but, I, yeah, those are the two things I'd like to leave people with. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, Luke? Um, I guess the... As to the subject, I, I, I want to encourage your listeners to, to stay involved and keep your ears open as to these, these cases. Um, they, sometimes they hit the news and they're gone in a day or two, uh, but the people remain on death row. And uh, talking to your uh, representatives uh, and letting them know what you think about it is an important part of it. Uh, uh, Congressman Dutton, I think, has uh, put a different bill every year since 2003 that impacts the death penalty. And he does marches every, every year for social justice, uh, for, for justice reform. Um, but if you, you know, just stay involved, uh, talk to your congressman, uh, learn about the issues. Um, I think the biggest case for um, the law, the biggest application in Texas for the, the, the law of parties was the Texas Seven. Uh, seven inmates broke out of jail, robbed a sporting goods store, and in the process, a responding officer was shot 11 times and run over by a vehicle. Six were captured, a seventh committed suicide. All were tried and convicted under the law of parties. Four were executed. Two are still on death row to this day. Uh, One is uh, Patrick Murphy. Uh, Murphy is a 
uh, the one of the participants who stood outside of the, the sporting goods store was not aware of the death and actually left the scene before the death happened um, and was not didn't learn about it until after the fact. He is okay. currently a devout Buddhist and requested death rights be administered. He was set for execution last November, um, which involved chanting some texts uh, from sacred texts so that his soul could be guided towards nirvana. And that ceremony was being denied at, for him at his execution. Um, that mm-hmm. sentence was stayed. The second is Mr. Halpern. He appealed his case because the judge that sat on the case, uh, talking about uh, biases, were, was a known anti-Semite, and uh, Mr. Halpern was Jewish. And um, just last April, the Supreme Court declined to hear that case in April of this year. You'll note that neither of the arguments that they're making relies on the lesser culpability. Uh, and it should. Uh, we should consider... Mm-hmm. Um, a restorative justice, as uh, as Michael said, we should consider um, what uh, punishing the crime and not uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, and uh, and looking to intent. And again, I just encourage that you you learn about this stuff and you keep tabs on what's happening after the articles leave the newspaper. Um, so that's what I would uh, suggest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I think education. Um, is is very essential in regards to, I mean, no one gets up and say, okay, I'm going to, well, I hope they don't, unless it's a premeditated uh, type of offense. You know, I'm just going to get up and, and, you know, I'm going to go in and rob this uh, bank tomorrow or what have you, um, and that's uh, perhaps something that we'll talk about on another show, and perhaps um, I could be able to invite you all back on that, and then, uh, you know, it was a, a, an individual. I used to work in uh, for the federal um uh, um, U.S. Marshals some years ago, and so th- this particular crime was this guy was mentally ill, and so he was he did not know how to drive, and um, and so the, this this individual in the community walked up and gave him a piece of paper, and so he would always go in and cash his check because he was you know he had a mental illness, and so he would always go uh, and walk up to the drive-through and cash his check and get his money, so. This um, other individual, which I think he was African American, went in and went walked up there to him, gave him the letter, and told him to give it to the teller through the through the slot. And so when she gave it to him, the the mental illness guy got arrested, but it it was not his fault. And things is 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 that he was just mentally ill. He just did what this guy asked him. So he served about three years for that. And so I was still working for the for the U.S. Marshals, and here he comes right back in there 15 months later. The same guy, after he had got out, he went in there. They restored his, his uh, financial uh, uh, income that he has every month. The same offender had, well, he didn't get, a, the, uh, the African-American guy didn't get arrested, but he knew that this mental illness um, individual was out of incarceration went right in there and gave him another note, you know, two, what, 15 months after he had served the three years, went in there and gave him another note, told, and, and after he walked up there, did the same thing, and he was right, the mental illness guy he had to take the rap for it. He did not know what he was doing because when he came to us, you could tell it was something wrong with him off the bat. And so perhaps maybe that will be another discussion that we could be able to um, – get some answers on uh, for, for the audience in regards to that because that is, I mean, it seemed like someone should have saw straight through that because we did when when uh, we booked him in. We saw straight through it. This guy don't need to be here. But it was just, it was to the fact of he was the one that gave them the note. And so that's how he got, um, you know, uh, slammed for that crime. So anyway, um and that that really is still offends me, and this has been probably about 15 years ago, and it still is offensive to me today, okay? And so uh, with that being said, uh, with the last remarks, we're going to let both of you be able to share how the listeners um, can be able to find you if you would like to share your links, if you would like to share any publications that you have written where they can be able to find that. You can also be able to share your uh, social media handles and how they can be able to uh, continue to track uh, your interest, your uh, field of interest. And so we'll start with Michael. Great. Thank you. Um, I have to say I'm a little choked up from how sad the story you just told was in the two cases that Luke related and how emblematic they are of of what can go wrong. And, and, um, and, and, and Diane, the story with the mentally ill guy, 
I, I'm p- positive that under no law of any jurisdiction here should he have been found guilty. But what that points out is that um, defendants' rights on paper um, are far and away very far from always adhered to. Um, okay, that said, my website is it's basically my name, michaelgoldstein.us. Um, there were too many Michael Goldsteins around to get .com, so it's michaelgoldstein.us. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Michael, is, people always ask, it's M-I-C-H-A-E-L, and Goldstein is G-O-L-D-S-T-E-I-N. Um, so michaelgoldstein.us, if you want to email me, hit me up at Michael and then the at sign, michaelgoldstein.us. If your interest was piqued by, you know, what I inserted about my view of politics in our system, um, check out on Amazon my book, Return of the Light, a political fable in which the American people retake their country about the second nonviolent American revolution uh, and if you're interested in my forthcoming book, Blessed Disillusionment, letting go of what doesn't work, letting go of what can't stay us and turning to what can, uh, send me an email, and that should be coming out in January, and I'll let you know about it. Uh, my Twitter handle is the at sign R-O-T-L author. So like the, the book title, Return, R-O-T-L for Return of the Light, R-O-T-L author. Um, and you know I'm on Instagram I can't remember what it's called there <laughs> and uh, <laughs> on Facebook and there are a lot of Michael Goldstein on Facebook my page I'm pretty sure is uh, Michael Goldstein dot 948 okay okay great that's, and what, I they saw assigned, that too. that's what they assigned me Sorry. okay I saw that too I saw several several several, several Michaels that popped up when I did a little research on your background and stuff, several. So you are absolutely right with that. Go ahead, Luke. So I uh, I am still in the trenches. I admire uh, uh, Michael's uh, uh, position and his ability to do appellate work. I always admire reading the opinions as they come down, and, and uh, sometimes I, uh, when the judges don't go criminal defense's way, they always... Um, uh, cause some type of uh, uh, anger and frustration. Um, so I don't have a lot of publications or anything like that because I'm still down here, down here in the trenches, and uh, most of my work is done in the courtroom. Um, uh, you can uh, find it, find me at our uh, website, which is Albers. Um, you can Google Albers and Associates. We've got a, a number of offices here in Maryland, but the site is www.rossalbers, and that's A L. B is in boy, E-R-S, dot com. And our number is 443-457-3890. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just uh, Google uh, just uh, Luke Woods Attorney. I think it comes up as Albers and Associates uh, in my LinkedIn page. And um, my email, if you ever want to reach out and uh, talk about uh, these subjects or any other subjects uh, related to criminal defense is L. Woods. That's the letter L W O O D S at RossAlbers.com. That's R O S as in Sam, S as in San, Albers with a B, dot com. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. So, audience, we have learned so much today um, and from both of these attorneys. They have given us credible attorneys and information. In- Thank you so much for being with us, both of you, on the broadcast on today, and we will certainly have you back on the panel real soon. So for everyone, take care and thank you. Thank you, Diane. And thank you.